praise God. And as you receive those things, it just brings wonderful healing. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Praise Amen. God. Glory to God. That's like my favorite thing to say. Glory to God. Um, it's a great honor to be here with you guys. Thank you, Phelim and, and Nicola, for, for having me. You guys are a great blessing. Your church here is a great blessing to me. Um, I know you might think I came here to give something to you all, but um, this church is a great encouragement to me. It's a great encouragement to me all the way in Louisiana to know that you guys are gathering here believing on the goodness of God. And it's a powerful thing that you guys come together in one spirit. So, um, man, I honor all of you all. And I hope you know that um, the, the word and the praise and the fellowship that comes out of this place, it echoes in the earth, right? And it echoes the love of God and it echoes the praise of God. Um, I was just, uh, let me, I'm going to try and do multiple things at one time. Although they say women are better at doing more than one thing at one time. And sometimes I think it's true that men can get focused on one thing and um, forget what they're doing. So you guys bear with me as I, I try and do this. The reason why I can end up preaching for so long is because I pray before the services. I take it very seriously. What do you want to say to these people, Lord? And I get something very clear. And then I come to the service and I get a whole bunch of other stuff that I want to say. And then you never want to eliminate any of it. Um, but I will have mercy on your souls. And whenever we get to the time, I'll just stop no matter where it's at. And I'll pick it up um, tonight. But as we're doing praise and worship, we were talking about and singing about how Jesus prayed for the disciples. And um, Jesus prayed that we would know that the Father loved us in the exact same way that the Father loved him. And that that was really, for this cause, we come into the earth. These people are not knowing that you love them because they can see, they, can, they have naturalized and they're looking at themselves after the flesh and they can see things manifesting in their life sometimes and they can see things manifesting in the earth sometimes and those things try to convince them that you don't really love them that you find fault with them because of what you see coming out of their lives. And so Jesus comes into the earth. He knows that the Father loves him, and he knows not even the death that can manifest in him on the cross could keep the Father from loving him. And now he's praying to the Father that we might know that the Father loves us the same way that he loves Jesus. That's a magnificent statement. My goodness. I mean, imagine that. All of us believe the Father loves Jesus. But if we're honest with each other, sometimes we can struggle that, to believe that the Father loves us the same way. The same way, he said. Not a lesser way. You're talking about a guy that lived perfectly. You're talking about a guy who never sinned. You're talking about a guy who always did the right thing all of the time. And we're in a world that tries to convince us that love and acceptance is found in our behavior. In how we live. In how we do things. And whether we do them right. And that causes us to have a stumbling block. When we think about the Father loves us in the same way that the Father loves Jesus. And so Jesus says, glorify me that it will glorify you. I'm going to enter into these people's sin and death. I'm going to enter into the very place where they think you're not loving them. And then they're going to see themselves in my face. And then you're going to show up and you're going to pick me up out of the grave. And you're going to glorify me with your life right in their presence. And they're going to see that you love them. The love of God is found in what he done to raise Jesus from the dead and pour out of himself his indestructible, incorruptible life. That's where the love of God is found. That's why we know he loves us. He gave his own body to be broken so that his life could come pouring out onto all of us. We have the song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places in the States. We try to find love in corruptible things, right? But corruptible things can never actually satisfy our lives or our desire for love. The only thing that can satisfy our lives and our desire for love is an incorruptible life. 
a life that can't be stolen from, a life that is so much that it can't be added to, a life that is so much that even should all the sin and death in this world come upon it, that life will stand back up and say, what? That's the only thing that can satisfy our hearts. Now, what manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us that he has emptied himself and given us of himself that life? You know, we can get caught up in looking with our natural eyes sometimes. Is that just me? I mean, we have these natural eyes. It's nice to see the beautiful flowers and the beautiful sun and the beautiful sky. You know, it's nice. But sometimes we can get caught in the trap of using our natural eyes to try to figure out if God's working in our lives or not. If God's with us, sorting it out. And as I was praying this morning before I came here, I just felt like a word for the body of Christ that don't get caught in the trap of judging whether or not God's at work in your life by what you see with your natural eyes, right? He's baptized you in the fire of his life. His incorruptible seed has been deposited inside of you. God's life is a consuming fire. And that fire, when he baptized you in his fire, he deposited the fire of his life inside of you. In that fire, his life is always working to consume everything that tries to come against you, everything that could ever produce fear and worry and anxiety and cares inside of you. It's all the time working inside of you, even when you can't see it, consuming everything that tries to harm you. And we get caught up looking with our natural eyes and we can't see it sometimes inside of us. We don't think it's there. We don't think it's working. But that seed is always bringing roots deep down and always bearing fruit. It's always working, the Holy Spirit is. And it's just like it says that the Holy Spirit intercedes in our hearts. I want to intercede in your heart today in case you've been looking at your life with natural eyes and you've been wondering, where's God? Is God working? Is God with me? What's going on? I want to intercede in your heart right now because just as Paul said that the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings that can't be uttered. Sometimes you can't see it. Sometimes you don't hear it. That doesn't mean he isn't working. Jesus was in the grave for three days. And that didn't mean that the Father wasn't working. And that didn't mean the Father wasn't going to produce life in him. You have a certainty of life. Nothing can stop it. We'll just pray real quick. In my church, you do really good with the announcements. Don't let a preacher do the announcements. They give me the announcements, and I go on for 30 minutes. I'll turn everything into a message. I mean, he's up here talking. I'm like, Lord, don't let me hear that. I'm going to preach off of that. Oh, man. Father, we come together today according to your will that it be on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for calling forth heaven in us. Let heaven manifest in this place. Let every form of sin and death that has tried to come against anyone, let it be bound in the name of Jesus. Let your life be loosed in every single person in this place in the name of Jesus. I just want to read through some some famous passages, just a couple of verses. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Chapter verse 9 and 10, where the disciples asked Jesus to teach us how to pray. And he says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means to be set apart. Jesus sees God is set apart unto bringing forth life in the earth and in you. And so he's talking to the Father according to his will. Jesus said that if you pray according to the Father's will, that the Father will give you what you've asked for. Well, when you pray according to the Father's will, you want to understand that hallowed be his name, which means he's set apart to bringing forth his fruit in you. He's set apart to bringing forth his life in you. That's why his name is hallowed. That's what makes God holy. He's set apart. There's no darkness and death in him. There's no death in his hand to give anyone. All he can give people is life. He's set apart. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. Now, God's will isn't just for it to be on earth as it is in heaven. His will is also for it to be in you as it is in heaven. And the gospel is God calling forth 
heaven in all of us. That's what the gospel is about. That's his will. He's trying to call forth heaven in you. And when he calls forth heaven in you, he's not telling you to produce heaven. What he's doing is he's bringing forth heaven inside of you by the power of his word. The power for heaven to be born in you is in God coming and saying, let it be in them as it is in heaven. Just like he said, let there be light. He didn't ask the light to produce itself. He just come and said, let there be light and light was. Right. So God's will is for it to be in you as it is in heaven. When we preach the gospel, we're calling forth heaven inside of people. We're calling forth the life of God inside of people. And so I want everybody here to know, and, and like Phelan said so beautifully, I don't come here to tell you something new. I come to stir you up by way of remembrance. But I don't know if you know, because sometimes we're in a world that don't look like heaven's here. It doesn't look like the kingdom of God is here sometimes. And sometimes you can get confused and wonder, where's heaven? Well, let me tell you where heaven is. Heaven has exploded inside of all of you. That's where heaven is. Heaven is inside of you. Heaven and earth have collided inside of you. And you might think, how can that be? Well, God, who is in heaven, and you, which are earthy, weren't we made from the dust of the ground? Well, we're the earthy ones. Well, God is the one in heaven. Well, he poured out his Holy Spirit on all flesh. And when we called upon the name of the Lord, that which was heavenly collided with that which is earthy. And now heaven and earth have collided in us through the body of Jesus Christ. We have become one with God Almighty through the body of Jesus' death and resurrection. He divorced us from this world on the cross. And when he was raised up and sat at the right hand of God, now he opened up the heavens for all of us. And now we come freely to the throne. Isaiah says to God, the heavens are your throne and the earth is your footstool. But where is the place that you find your rest? We have this funny saying in the States that home is where your heart is. It's not just a building that you live in. Home is where your heart is. I might say with my wife, my wife, my, my heart is with my wife. That's my home, right? Well, God's heart is with all of us. You're his home. Isaiah comes and says that you're the place where God finds his rest. You're the place where he finds his rest. Heaven has found its resting place inside of you. God in heaven found its resting place inside of all of you. And God has invited us to enter into his rest. And he's found his rest in you. And the rest that he's offered us is the rest that will come upon us when we see God Almighty made us his dwelling place. And God can live anywhere. He can build anything. And so when he come and decided to dwell in you, it means he likes you. A good preacher friend of mine likes to say, God likes human. He likes human. And when God thought of what would be the most magnificent place for him to spend all eternity dwelling, when he thought of what can give the most expression to my life and the love that's in me, when he thought of what can express it the most, he thought of human. That's why he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He first decided where he wanted to live for all eternity. He could have dwelt in anything. We're not a charity case, brothers and sisters. And not even the sin and the death in the world could keep him from wanting to dwell in us. He wasn't deterred. So if it's in us as it is in heaven, how, would it, how is it in heaven? Those aren't just fancy words, guys. We come together and we quote the scripture and we sing the songs and thank God we do that. They're powerful. But man, the Lord is calling for something in his people where these words and these sayings are no longer cliches. We're not busy with Christian cliches. It means something for it to be in us as it is in heaven. And we ought to spend some time thinking about that with the Lord. That's a magnificent statement. It's nothing to be made common. It's not a common thing that heaven has manifested inside of you. And so how is it? You guys, can you tell I'm excited about the gospel? <laughs> How? And get caught up with this with God when you go home. Lord, I believe what that guy says. Heaven's in me. But what does that mean? 
And watch as he unpacks it for you. And it changes everything. Right? So how is it in heaven? There's no sin in heaven. I said there's no sin in heaven. There's no death in heaven. There's no corruption in heaven. There's no tribulation in heaven. There's a man, the son of man. His name is Jesus. I don't know if you heard about him. He sitteth at the right hand of God, and he has been perfected from sin and death once for all time, never to be able to be touched by weakness or corruption or sin and death ever again. He possesses in himself a life that overcomes all things, that is all things, that inherits all things, that possesses all things. He has a life in him that overcomes the world and overcomes the tribulation in the world. Let it be in you as it is in heaven. The Son of Man seated at the right hand of God. Stephen said, I see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God. And you might have stones in your hand thinking you can take my life, but it's in me as it is in heaven. And I see there's a life in heaven that even overcomes death in the flesh. So go ahead and try to take my life because I will be raised up in a glorified immortal body that can never die again. And that's the confidence and the boldness the gospel is designed to call forth in all of us. And then we become witnesses of the resurrection. And not just witnesses that a historical event has occurred, but witnesses in the earth that there's a life that binds sin and death. There's a life that looses uh, an incorruptible, immortal body inside of human beings. There's a life that overcomes death in the flesh. That's what we're witnesses of. And do you know what witnesses of that the most? When you sneer at death. When you start mocking death. When your heart's been purified from the fear of death. When you see death and you command the death to bow down. Not because you're trying to work a program or you're trying to exercise authority, but because you see life has slayed death already. And now you're walking in the light of life. Right? There's no darkness anymore. A great light has shined in the midst of the earth. And then you're walking around as a sign and wonder. A sign and wonder of what? That there's a life that overcomes death. You don't have to be afraid anymore. There's a life that even overcomes death in the flesh. Sin can't even take these bodies. God's going to raise up an incorruptible, immortal body. <laughs> oh. First John says those who have the Son have life. They have life. He doesn't say they can get life. He doesn't say if you can fix everything in the world around you, then you'll have life. Those who have the Son have life. He says, if you have the Son, you are born of God and cannot sin. <laughs> he says you cannot sin. That's a magnificent statement because for so long we've been taught sin from the perspective of it being about behavior. How many of you have wrestled with that one? I mean, when I was a young guy, I wrestled with that. What are you talking about? I have the son, I know, but you're telling me I cannot sin. Well, I still see that there's times where I feel weak and things come out of me that I know aren't born from above. So what do you mean that I cannot sin? What do you mean if I have the son, I cannot sin? Well, that word sin there is a noun. It's not a verb. It's not talking about behavior there. It's talking about the mark of God's life. It's talking about having the Father's life, His life that He has in Himself. It's talking about if you have the Son, the Son is the life of the Father. And if you have the life of the Father, you can't miss the mark. I don't know if you know this, but God's mark for your life isn't that you can behave properly. When He created you, He wasn't thinking, well, my goal for them is that they could be good little boys and girls. When he created you, his goal for you was that you could live forever and never die. And he could spend all his days loving you with all his heart, all his soul, and all his strength. Now listen, when you are filled with the love of God, when lack is removed from your heart, and you believe that you're fully accepted in the beloved, and you find all your desires for life satisfied, it will put your flesh to rest. It will. And it will cause all the works of the flesh that have come out of you to fall away. But that's not God's end goal for you. He understands the root of the matter. He doesn't come to pick fruit off of a tree. He comes to take an axe to the root. And there's a reason why Paul calls it the fruit of death. 
He calls it the fruit of death because it's a heart stung by the fear of death that produces the fruit that we call the works of the flesh that we don't like. And the reason we don't like it is because we know it's contrary to life. We know it's not the fruit of life. And then we think God's trying to fix our behavior so he can like us. Well, God's not like a human. He doesn't judge after the flesh. He doesn't think that we got to clean the outside of the cup. He doesn't think that he needs to tell us to clean the outside of the cup. What he sees is the root of what's producing the fruit. And so what he does is he says, death is the root that's producing the fruit. So we're going to come and take an ax to the root. And the way we're going to take an ax to the root is we're going to conquer death in the midst of our people. And then we're going to show them there is a life. That's greater than the death in this world. There is a life that is so much it manifests. There is a life that can't be stolen from or added to. We're going to show them what it does to death. It even mocks death. It consumes death. It leaves death at the place where it doesn't even exist anymore. How many of you see death in the body of the Lord Jesus? Where did it go? And what swallowed it up? He shows us that life, and then he comes and says, I'm giving it to you as a gift because I'm not ashamed to call you my own. I've never been ashamed to stand with you. I know you judged yourself and you judged my heart, but I never confused who you were with what you've done. Right? That's how he heals you from the works of the We're so busy trying to clean ourselves up. But Jesus himself said, I judge no one after the flesh. Why? Because he sees into the heart and he sees the fear of death that stings our hearts. And he understands that's what's causing these people to labor and toil. That's what's taking these people from rest. That's why the fruit of death is manifesting out of them. So if we can put their flesh to rest, if we could pluck out that fear of death from their heart, if we could fill their heart with the abundant life, isn't that why he said he came? I came to give them a life and life more abundantly. He came to give us a life that superabounds over death. So that even if we encounter death in this world, all of a sudden his life wells up in our hearts and swallows the sting of death that tries to come against our heart. And it puts our flesh to rest where we don't try to perfect our own lives from the corruption. But in the place of encountering corruption, we find something else come forth in our heart. And what comes forth in our heart is Abba. Into your hands I commit my desire for life. Into your hands I commit my desire for peace, for love, for joy. Sin has no opportunity to produce its fruit in you if your heart's been healed from death. It uses death to produce its fruit. Right? And so that's, we're in a world where we can see corruption and death. And it's tempting us to try to gather peace to ourselves. How many of you like it when you don't feel peace? Is anybody like, oh, hallelujah, let's just chill here. And so it's tempting us. When you, when you feel unloved, when you feel that your reputation is being slandered, when you feel like your name is being drugged through the mud, how many of you like it? None of us. Do you know why? Because we know it's not right. We know it's, injustice isn't right. And so it's tempting us to try to gather acceptance and peace and love and joy to ourselves. But the gospel comes and shows us the Father is with us to serve us with those things. And that all those things we desire are actually contained in his life. And that he's given it to us as a gift. And then that life swallows up the tribulation we encounter in our hearts. And all of a sudden our hearts feel like the Father is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Yea, though I may be in a valley that's shadowed by death, the death is not lifted up in my heart, O Lord, because I see you are with me even in me. Right? The gospel sets before you his life. And I promise you, when you see his life, and you see what his life looks like next to death, you'll no longer have death lifted up in your heart. You'll no longer be in awe of death and tribulation. You'll no longer be filled with fear. But what will happen is a life that swallows death will be lifted up in your heart. And you'll see God. The sin and death in the world cannot keep you from life. It can't. He couldn't keep the Father from you. He came in the midst of it. Here I am. Everlasting Father. That's what the resurrection declares. Everlasting Father. Come to be with His children and to minister life to them. To heal them from their sicknesses and their diseases. 
It can't keep you from the Father. That's what Paul come and said in Romans 8. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Neither shipwreck, nor famine, nor sword. None of these things could ever testify to me again that the Father isn't with me and that I'm separated from what I need to have life because I see the Father drew near to me in the man Jesus Christ and condemned death in the flesh. How can anything that happens in this world tell me the Father is far from me when I see the Father has condemned death? That's what Paul says in Romans 8. Go read it closely. We gloss over these things. We read the Bible like it's a novel. It's more like a lovely dance that you're doing with the Father, where you stop and you're caught up into the Spirit. And it's a lovely waltz where He's dipping you and you're swirling around and you're just talking about, what does this mean, Lord? The tribulation and corruption in the earth cannot stop life from manifesting in you. It can't. It will tell you it can because it will want to fill you with fear and anxiety. It will want to convince you that God isn't here. You ever notice that that's when we feel like God isn't with us, when we encounter hard times? <laughs> and we didn't think God was with Jesus, and then God raised him from the dead. <laughs> you have a sinless life. That's what John said. You have a sinless life. I'm going to say it again, because that's the cry in every human heart. We wake up every day wanting a sinless life. The problem is we look out into the world to let the world tell us whether we have a sinless life or not. We look at what we see manifesting in our bodies to try and get a word about whether we have a sinless life. <clears throat> There's x-ray machines, MRI machines. They take an image of you to try to see what's going on to give you an image of your life, right? And we want, we're actually created to long for a sinless life. That's why we feel so tormented sometimes when we see things that don't look right. How many of you ever felt like, Lord, just take this already? How long must I labor? I don't want this thing. Why do you even feel that way? Right? See, the world tries to be an x-ray machine and an MRI to us of the life we have. And it shows us all the things in the world around us. And it points at things in our lives and it tries to tell us that our lives have spots and blemishes. Right? That our lives are decaying. That moths are eating our lives. And rust is corrupting them. Right? But the Lord Jesus came to give you a sinless life. And now he sits at the right hand of God, possessing a sinless life. And he is the Father's testimony to us that if you have the Son, you have the sinless life you are always longing for already. The same sinless life that's in the Lord Jesus in heaven is in you. That's the power of God to cause you to walk on the water in this earth. It wasn't just a fancy story where Peter's walking on the water. You can walk above the storms of this life. And the power to walk above the storms in this life is for your heart to be persuaded that the same sinless life you see in Jesus is inside of you and you possess it right now. I mean, the reason why we call Jesus Lord is because we're under the reign of his indestructible life. He's Lord even over death. He made death bow down. And now when we say Lord, it's not just a fancy thing like we do with kings and queens in the earth. It's a whole different kind of a meaning. When we say Lord, we're acknowledging that we're under the ministration of his indestructible life. And we're receiving nutrients from that indestructible life every day. Daily, I wake up and talk with God about what it means that he gave me of himself a sinless life. Yeah. A life that's dwelling in me, working all the time, consuming everything that would try to destroy my life. I can tell you a bunch of complicated things. People that know me know that I can. But the most powerful thing is for you to be persuaded that you have the Father's life. Whose life do you have? When we talk about being born from above, what are we talking about? We're talking about our life is no longer earthy. It's no longer but dust. The life we have, even in these earthen vessels, has come from the loins of the Father. 
And so can the corruption in this world take down the father? Can the sin and death in this world corrupt the father? Well, whose life do you have? And that's why Jesus told the apostles to wait till you be filled with power from on high. What power? The father's light. And you see a bunch of guys who were scared to even go out into the streets. Peter didn't even want to acknowledge the Lord. Oh, I don't know that guy. Peter, the most braggadocious one. No, I don't know him. No, no, I was never with him. That's the fear of death. He knew what was coming, and he was afraid of death because he thought his life could be corrupted by death and sin and corruption. He saw his life hidden in the world, and he saw his life having spots and blemishes and decay on it. And so he was filled with fear and wanted to preserve his own life. Jesus says, don't try to take to the streets now. Wait till the spirit that was in me, the spirit that I am, the spirit of life, the father's seed. Wait till that come and be deposited in you and you be filled with the boldness, the kind of boldness that comes when you no longer think death can steal from you. Let him who has stole steal no more. We're the body of Christ and nothing can steal from him. And we're walking around in the world and letting the world continue to convince us it can steal from us. COVID can't steal from us. The governments of this world can't steal from us. The things that have tried to harm your life can't steal from you. Your life isn't fragile. You don't have a fragile life. The things people did to you, they can't steal from you. But the world comes and tells you it can. Because the world tries to get you to find your life hidden in the things of the world. In your relationships, in your jobs, in your governments, in your health. And then it tries to define your life by those things. And it gets you to walk around hungover, filled with fear, filled with death, looking at your life as if there's spots and blemishes everywhere. Now you start trying to protect your life from the spots and blemishes. All the while, you need it to be put, sat down at the feet of Jesus and behold the sinless life in him. A life that cleanses, a life that perfects. God provided himself a lamb and he's perfected you from the death in this world once for all time already. He's cleansed you. You possess a life that can no longer be defiled by this world. Your life is of a heavenly substance. It's of the self-same substance of the Father. Listen, man, that will blow your mind. And we gloss over that because we need to get to more important things so we can figure out all these doctrines. Jesus knew that was the only thing. It says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Fear doesn't mean to be afraid. The beginning of wisdom is to stand in awe of the Father and the life He has in Himself. What happens is, is when you see His life is your life, it heals your sight. It pops open your ears. And you begin to see the world according to a life that overcomes death instead of seeing the world according to death. That gives you wisdom. And you don't even know how you have it. You didn't do anything to get it. You didn't try to figure out any of these doctrines. You didn't try to figure out how to produce life or try to produce the gifts of the Spirit. The Bible says the Spirit moves as the Spirit wills. And the will of the Spirit is to reveal the Father to you. Because that which is perfect is the love that comes from the Father when you see He's given you His life. And that love will never fail you. It will always keep you. And then what happens is is you find the life of God manifesting out of you more accidentally than when you were all trying to make it come forth. And then a beautiful thing comes forth because you realize you didn't do anything to bring it forth. And then you're left with one saying, glory to God. (laughs) Your DNA is from above. You're in the family tree of God himself. His seed is in you. That's why Jesus said, call no man on earth your father. He wasn't saying not to esteem your earthly father. I love my earthly father. That man has laid down his life for me over and over and over and over again. And I will spend the rest of eternity thanking him, right? But as great as my dad is, as much as he loves me, and as much as he loves me today, he could never give me an incorruptible life. 
he could only point me to the one who could give it to me. Right? And so, brothers and sisters, we, we follow so much about our genealogies and our family trees. We even go online and run these tests to find out our heritage. But your heritage is from above. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and revealed Himself to be the Father of mankind. That's your heritage. That's your lineage. And it teaches some, you something about your life when you see God your Father. You begin to think about what kind of a life you have. Boy, when you become persuaded you have the life of the Father, it changes everything. No one, no one has to tell you to love your enemies. You just find yourself loving your enemies. Do you know why? Because you no longer think they can hurt you. And when you no longer believe that people can hurt your life, you're no longer thinking of what your life needs. And you're able to be set free to see what's happening to the people's lives that are actually setting themselves up as your enemies. And you're able to see that it's death working in them and that death is tormenting them and they're filled with fear. And you're more worried about them being set free than you are about preserving yourself because you have a father in heaven who has already preserved you with his life. And no one has to tell the father to love his enemies. That's how his life gets down. You see, in the church, we've been real good at looking at the fruit of God's life. And we can agree it's good. But then what we've done is we should do that. We ought to do that. God requires we do that. Never understanding that, that all those things are the fruit of God's life. And God comes to persuade us we have a sinless life. And then out of that comes forth this beautiful fruit. Right? And then we start testifying of that life in the earth. Right? Jesus said he gave us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That which, is bound, that which you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That which you loose in earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's a funny wordplay there, right? Because it's actually opposite. Jesus isn't saying what we bind in earth will then be bound in heaven. What he's saying is what you see bound in heaven, declare it in the earth and it will be bound also. What you see loosed in heaven, declare it loosed in the earth and it will be loosed also. And so he's given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And we're walking around binding sin and death in people's lives. And do you know how you bind sin and death in people's lives? You declare a life that overcomes death in the flesh. Amen. And what you're doing is you're calling down heaven in the earth. <laughs> and then the fire comes down. Amen. And it consumes death in the presence of the people. The word, you know, in Hebrew, binding and loosened, do you know what it means? Let me find it here. I don't want to misquote it. In ancient Hebrew, to bind and loose simply means to forbid by an indisputable authority and to permit by an indisputable authority. So when God raised Jesus from the dead, do you know what he was doing? He was forbidding destruction in your life. He was forbidding sin from overcoming your life, right? He's sentimental about you. You're, much, you're worth so much more than what you think you can do for God. I mean, if we're speaking as fools, some people might think I do a lot for God. People back where I'm from, they could be like, this guy all day, all night. Look at what he's doing for God. Man, I'm not doing something for God. I see that the Father doth work. And all I'm doing is declaring the Father's work. Right? And you're so much more valuable than what you think you can do for God. He's sentimental about your life. And when he saw sin and death destroying your life, when he saw it filling you with fear, when he saw it making your body weak, when he saw it bringing sicknesses and diseases and stress and cares and burdens, he came and he entered into the midst of that body of death. And then he consumed death out of that body from the inside out. And in the resurrection, it isn't just that a man was raised. A man was raised, but he's the word made flesh. And he was the father forbidding destruction from overcoming his people's lives. Amen. He was the father forbidding sin from stealing from us anymore. He was crushing the serpent's head. Amen. You know how he crushed the serpent's head? He destroyed death. That's how you take somebody from rest. You sting them with death. That's what it means for your sin to be forgiven. The traditions of man make the word of God of none effect. In Hebrew and Greek, forgiveness does not talk about a person who was very mad at somebody else, and then they found a way to no longer be mad anymore. 
It's like we got God going through a 10-step anger management program. <laughs> we all say it's a sin to be offended, and we need to not dwell in unforgiveness, but we don't think about these things. We got God dwelling in unforgiveness. We got God being offended. And then we think that he had to go through some 10-step program so he could no longer be offended with us anymore over our sin. I promise you, if we think we shouldn't be offended, how are we going to say God's offended? And if we teach people God was offended, how are we ever going to be free from offense if we're beholding a God we say was offended? He's not so fragile that he's offended by what you do because he knows in him is a life that overcomes. He's busy thinking of healing when he sees you. I mean, Jesus, we trans, the mankind transgressed Jesus. And what was Jesus busy doing? Was he offended on the cross? Did he curse us when we cursed him? Did he speak evil of us when we spoke evil of him? Why not? Why wasn't he offended? If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. If you've seen Jesus and how he responded to our sin against him, you've seen the Father and how the Father will respond to our sin. And what you see in Jesus is Jesus blessing those who cursed him. You see him praying for those who despitefully used him. You see him returning our evil with good. And why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. In the way you heal somebody from their sin and from their hatred and anger and murder and envy and backbiting is you come and love them in the place where they're a wretch. And you come and show them that you prefer their life over your own in the place where they feel worthless. Blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> Forgiveness in the Hebrew means to divorce one party from another. It means to divorce. So if two things are joined, you would come and separate them. It means to send away, to send something away from someone. And so the forgiveness of sin, the wages of sin is death. Do you know even in that, the, the forgiveness of sin, in that phrase, the word sin there is a noun. And you could easily read it as the forgiveness of death because the wages of sin is death. And so when we talk about the forgiveness of sin, what well, we're talking about how God, God himself came and divorced us from death. He came and sent death away from us. He came to sup with us in our house, just like he came and supped with the Hebrews in the Exodus, and he caused the messenger of death to pass over us. He divorced us from death so that we might be free to be married to another, even Christ Jesus and the life he has in himself, that we might be fruitful and that we might bear his fruit because he's father. We want fruit so bad, we don't care how we get it. We just want to have it. And then we think it's good. And then we try to bring it to God. And God's like, but I'm not the one who brought forth that fruit. He's not just interested in you having fruit. He's interested in you bearing his fruit. I mean, Israel committed adultery on God. How do you commit adultery on God? They fornicated with their own strength trying to produce the fruit of his life. And that left them barren. Does this make any sense? So when I say your sin is forgiven, when Jesus says your sin is forgiven you, it means something very different than what we think. We're busy thinking about our bad behavior. And it's true, he doesn't judge you for your bad behavior. That's why we feel re relief at that explanation. But we're not busy with the gospel of relief. We're busy with the gospel that produces life. And we need to move on into the place where now we're busy with the sinless, incorruptible life. Because that's how the church is going to come out from underneath the bushel and shine like a light in an earth that's dying. Because I promise you this, the world is going to keep dying. And the darkness and the coldness and hardness of heart is going to keep growing. But do you know what's going to happen simultaneously? Is the life in the church is going to keep growing. And it's going to be like Jesus manifesting all over again in the earth. And it's going to be a testimony to people filled with fear and death. And they're going to think, why are these people hopeful? Why are they full of joy? Don't they see everything that's going wrong? And we will stand like Abraham. We won't consider the deadness we see in the earth. But we'll consider the life that's in God. And we'll be able to tell people why we're happy. That's how the church will be a hospital in the world. That's how you heal the sick. Life heals the flesh. Right? 
What I'm saying when I say your sin is forgiven is that God himself is with you, sending away from you that which harms your life. The resurrection is the proof and the evidence. Right? God himself. He's in you rebuking the devourer. His life rebukes the devourer. Does that make sense? I guess that's my way of saying amen. Amen. (laughs) So maybe, and I'll finish with this, maybe there's some of you that feel weakness in your body or your emotions. Maybe there's some of you that are feeling an ailment that's come upon your life and you're filled with fear, or maybe there's something happening in your life that's a burden, that you're carrying the burden yourself. And I just want to declare to you that God forbids that destruction from overcoming your life. God forbids you from carrying the burden of your own life or the life of others. He is with you to carry that burden. He cares for you. You can call out to him and leave your burdens for life in him. I just want to declare to you, receive strength in the name of Jesus. Be ye made whole in the name of Jesus. Your affliction cannot abide the presence of his life. Your weakness is not greater than his strength. You are not one body with the weakness and the death in this world. You are one body with God and his indestructible life through the Lord Jesus. Hmm. God put sin to death. He put death to death. When you look at the cross, behold God crucifying death. He issued a decree against death and sin. He put it on death row. Sin does not have eternal life. Death doesn't have eternal life. It's dying right now. It's actively perishing. Your life can't be decayed. Sin and death is being decayed. And so if you see sin and death in your life and you think you're being decayed, behold the cross and let the cross start ministering to you that it's death that's being decayed. The death is perishing, not you. Your life isn't perishing because it's imperishable. Thank you, Jesus. Man, I'll I'll finish there. I think I'm right around the, the time. That was a miracle. That was really good. Praise the Lord. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, that's the, that's the intro for tonight. Okay. Praise God.